The following program, The History of Man and Stone, a documentary, was produced by the Marble Institute of America through a very generous sponsorship grant from MS International, one of America's leading natural stone distributors, and with additional generous support from Daltile, with both natural stone retail locations and distribution centers across the country. Marmomac of Verona, Italy, the world's largest and most important natural stone trade shows. And Stone Expo Marmomac Americas, the leading natural stone exposition in North America held annually in Las Vegas. It's late September and the masses have descended upon the ancient Italian city of Verona. Architects, designers, quarriers, fabricators, contractors, distributors, building rehabilitation specialists, in fact, anyone who is anyone in the stone world hierarchy has made the annual pilgrimage to a stone extravaganza called Marmamac. It's a trade show like no other, featuring three and a half million square feet of exhibitions spread through a dozen exhibit halls, with 1,450 exhibitors from 57 countries. It's the ultimate expression of man's long-standing love affair with Mother Nature's crown jewels. Granite, marble, limestone, travertine, and other favorite natural stones used around the world in commercial and residential building and renovation. Including the sale of stone, of which there is virtually an unlimited supply around the world, and the equipment to quarry, fabricate, and install it. Industry volume is estimated at more than $50 billion a year. <laughs> Talk about a love affair. No one is bashful about this one. It's the fact that it's not man-made, and so the surprise of what it reveals when you see it, when you cut it open, when you look at it, it's perhaps a better artist than man could ever be. I think that stone has a classic quality about it, sort of eternal, and um, it adds a lot of grace to a project and a sense of permanence and, um, and luxury. Even if you reproduce uh, or repeat uh, projects, you never feel the same experience. I mean, at the end of the day, each uh, project is a challenge is a different situation and uh, this is what really makes uh, the love for natural stone. Uh, the variety of color, the, the possibility, the many possibilities that we have to work in terms of shaping, in terms of finishing, in terms of color. So the combination of color is, uh, is extraordinary. And then the beauty of stone belongs to the history. First and foremost, the love of the material. Stone if you talk to any architect who, who uh, particularly steeped in history, stone has a, an integrity because of the virtue of it being a natural material, a material which also has an architectural history of more than 3,000 years. And the older it gets, the better it looks. It's subtle, but it's sexy. It's fast, but it's timeless. All of those components are part of natural stone. If you have the ability to use stone, it's a tremendous plus. With this kind of admiration and the fact that it is a highly sustainable material with a long history of durability, the use of natural stone around the world has rarely been more robust, inhibited recently only by the global recession. The Love Affair is producing wonderful new projects of every kind. New stone-clad skyscrapers, religious institutions, sprawling office complexes, hotels, and more. In the United States and a growing number of other countries, the use of natural stone in the home has created a revolution in the design of kitchens and baths and other residential applications, creating a huge demand for stone products. Today, natural stone, once thought to be affordable only by the very wealthy, is very price competitive with other types of interior surface material. Getting to this point has been a long journey for the world's most enduring building material, one that encapsulates the history of mankind. From the days even before man came out of caves and started building things, from mostly a hand-driven craft where stone was tediously cut and moved by hand, 
The stone industry has recently benefited from massive doses of time-saving technology and machinery. This has greatly reduced its costs, vastly improved usage, and created a global industry that includes quarrying in more than 50 countries around the world. From the cradle of the stone business in Italy to busy quarries and fabricating shops around the globe, the natural stone industry has also benefited from the entrepreneurial men and women who had visions of what the business could be and stake their futures on it. Come with us as we navigate through time and bring you this intriguing story. The History of Man and Stone, a documentary. Actually, man's affection for natural stone goes back a long, long time, about two and a half million years, when it's thought humanity began. The earliest use of stone was to create tools and weapons which helped those inhabitants survive. Dr. Brian Redman, curator and chair of archaeology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, explains. Yeah, the earliest evidence we have of people making stone tools, and really when I say people, I mean early human ancestors, uh, people that were really even a different species than ourselves. Uh, but they were using uh, very primitive uh, flake tools about two and a half million years ago, They're some of the oldest stone tools in Africa. But most of the earliest tools are made from some kind of stone that you can flake or chip. That's something that's kind of glass-like. Obsidian is one type of stone that is very easy to flake because it's a volcanic glass. And the whole idea was to break a stone in such a way to produce a sharp edge. Because for these early humans, these early hominids, they pretty much needed stone tools to, to get meat. Not so much to kill animals, but to even scavenge you know, dead animals. Dr. Redman says the earliest tool in the museum's collection is what's called an Acheulean hand axe. And this type of tool dates back to just over a million years in Africa. It's made of flint, which is again a very glass-like stone, very fine-grained stone, and it's been fashioned basically by flaking, or flint napping as we say, uh, by carefully striking it at different angles to remove flakes, uh, thin pieces of flint from both sides to form a, a long straight cutting edge. Uh, the hand axe is a rather heavy stone. Um, uh, it could be held in the hand probably like that. You can use this for cutting open a carcass. You can use it for cutting sticks and wood. You can use it uh, even for digging in the ground to dig up roots and tubers and things like that. So it was a very versatile tool. Dr. Redmond showed some other examples of early tools, which were called blade tools or flake tools. They're like razor blades. When these are first made, the, the edges are extremely, extremely sharp, uh, very sharp, sharper than a metal scalpel. And you can use that just for cutting. The use of stone for creating some implements and weapons continued until the Bronze Age, which is thought to have begun about 3600 BC, when the use of copper and its alloy bronze were the chief hard materials used to manufacture these items. This morphed into the Iron Age, about 1200 BC. Eventually, stone tools and implements would play a vital role in the development of the wheel and key to expanding man's mastery over agriculture. Of the new metal tools, Dr. Redmond says, They didn't replace stone, they just were kind of added to the technology or to the toolkit. In the meantime, it also took more than two million years for civilization to reach a somewhat mature level. Early inhabitants, nomads for the most part, in time found shelter in caves, eventually built more permanent housing out of stone and wood, then gravitated to city-states ruled by monarchs. That's when the use of natural stone began to blossom, and when it did, about 5000 BC, the people who designed and built magnificent structures showed remarkable ingenuity and creativity. Even cranes and things today are the same physical principles as they used back then. It's just more durable materials, metal, hydraulics, things like that, to make it easier and more efficient to do that and lift heavier weights. But the principles are about the same. The first remarkable structures built with stone were the Egyptian pyramids, the first of which was the Step Pyramid at Saqqara, built for King Zosier in 2750 BC and orchestrated by Imhotep, considered to be the world's first architect. It was 204 feet high and constructed of small limestone blocks 
and desert clay and was the first application of large-scale technology. 150 years later, King Khufu commissioned the building of the largest pyramid of all, the Great Pyramid, one of the seven wonders of the world, a massive square structure 756 feet wide on each side and 461 feet high. It remained the tallest building in the world for 3,800 years. Archaeologists estimated that it took 100,000 slaves 20 years to build the structure at Giza. It required moving 800 tons of stone every day to accumulate the over 2 million limestone and granite blocks. A BBC documentary on building the Great Pyramid illustrates the incredible amount of handwork involved in cutting and moving the stone by water and land and installing it. Some of the granite pieces were transported some 500 miles from Aswan down the Nile River to the pyramid site. It was truly a remarkable feat. In all, archaeologists have identified 118 pyramids built in Egypt and others in Central and South America. Fortunately, Mother Nature was very generous when she began dispensing her natural stone gems around the world. That's because early on, the key to building the pyramids and other great early stone structures was based on relative proximity to a ready supply of stone. Every continent was blessed with the gift of stone, some of course more than others, which eventually led natural stone to become the first commodity ever traded by human beings. Italy's gift was marvelous marble and granite quarries and eventually a workforce of talented craftsmen, which enabled it to become the stone capital of the world. The vast and versatile continent of North America literally received it all. Marble, granite, sandstone, limestone, travertine, slate, and other materials. Brazil, Spain, India, Turkey, and China were also tremendous beneficiaries of huge stone deposits. Eventually, thanks to emerging technology, stone would be exported from more than four dozen countries. And there's more undiscovered stone out there. Some continents are richer in some stone types than others. I don't think we really have the knowledge to say that a stone type doesn't exist in a certain part of the world because we've really never prospected in, in some of the countries and looked deep enough below the Earth's surface to find what kind of mineral reserves are there. While the stones being quarried today were created over as many as three and a half billion years, Mulebauer says the earth is still making stone. If one is in the mountainous regions of New Mexico, you can stand at ponds that are spring fed and literally watch travertine being formed before your very eyes. So the earth is still making stone. Not only did nature create an abundance of stone, which is distributed geographically, it created a palette of products with a never-ending diversity of colors and enough difference in composition for multiple applications. Stone was the first medium of carving and writing, such as the Ten Commandments. From ancient days, it has been and remains a favorite of artists for creativity and preservation. Some of the great stone projects over history have been a blend of construction materials and sculpture. Marble is, is a material that's always been known for its elegance. It's a decorative material. It, it brings a sophistication to a design just because it is so unique in, in its, its structure, its makeup, its, its character. It's also extraordinarily durable. There are many applications where you see marble applications that have they've had people walking over them for, literally for centuries. Granite has been known for its hardness and its incredible palette of colors and patterns. While it has been used extensively for construction since the days of the pyramids, it has only come into its own as a decorative material because of new cutting and fabricating technology. The limestones are actually some of the softest rock types that we use in architectural applications. And historically, some, some of our classical buildings 
have always had a, an amount of limestone because, of, because it, it lent itself to the decorative and detailed carving. Travertine is a varietal name for a kind of limestone formed under special circumstances. Because of its, its formation, because of its, its redistribution, uh, it offers a much different character than, than limestone. And it has a, a certain beauty because of its bedding, because of the, the layering and the anisotropy in it. Muehlbauer explained that sandstone is comprised of one of the hardest materials in abundance, quartz. It eventually became a mainstay in the construction of government buildings. The massiveness of the stone gave you an appeal of permanence that that structure will be there forever. Finally, slate lends itself to applications where the use of thin sheets is desired. It's the only stone that has been used for centuries as roofing material. In the end, Mother Nature provided a wonderful array of raw material and natural stone. Man, with his creativity and ingenuity, found ways to build with it, carve it into beautiful sculptures, and turn it into lasting monuments for the departed. Eventually, with the help of modern technology and the fact that it is inherently sustainable because of its proven durability, a huge marketplace for stone as decorative material for the home was created, especially kitchens, baths, stairs, and fireplace surrounds. As man began to build great structures with natural stone, you could see all of the attributes that created and sustained this love affair throughout the ages. One of the great examples of Roman architecture and engineering was the Colosseum in Rome, built between 72 and 80 AD, originally called the Flavium Amphitheater. It was designed with 80 arched entrances to facilitate the movement of 50,000 people in and out. Travertine was the most prominent type of stone used in its construction. Notre Dame de Paris is considered one of the most prominent examples of Gothic architecture and one of the world's most well-known churches. It was started in 1163 and completed in 1345, 182 years later. A masterpiece of design, creativity, and travertine. The Milan Cathedral, or the Duomo, as it's primarily known, is famous for its incredible detail work. Amazingly enough, constructed primarily of marble, it was started in 1345 and not officially completed until 1965, a span of more than 600 years. The Taj Mahal, a white marble mausoleum located in India, is regarded by many as the finest example of Mughai architecture and the jewel of Muslim art in India. Begun in 1632, it took more than 20 years to complete and has stood for almost 500 years. Since the 13th century, a wide variety of stones have been used to build castles, royal palaces and churches. Most of them are still standing today, a testimony to the uncommon durability of stone. Since those early stone masterpieces, most of the world's memorable buildings erected have featured stone. These include the Pentagon, the massive five-sided five-ring headquarters for America's military, and the Empire State Building in New York, which for years claimed the title as the world's tallest building. If you want a primer for the use of natural stone, just visit Washington, D.C., where many of the U.S. government structures were built with marble, limestone, or some other type of natural stone. Mike Blair is manager at Vermont Marble Corporation's Danby Vermont Quarry, the world's largest underground marble quarry. Well, Washington, D.C., it's all over the place down there. You know, Pennsylvania Avenue could very well be called Vermont Marble Avenue. I mean, you have the U.S. Supreme Court building, you have the west side of the Capitol, all the U.S. Senate office buildings. Limestone, much of it from Indiana, also has a major presence. Among our more famous buildings out there was the Pentagon, uh, the Washington National Cathedral, the National Archives, 
uh, the IRS building and the interior of the Lincoln Memorial. Today, great new buildings of every kind and office complexes around the world are being built with natural stone. One recent example is Canary Wharf, a superb collection of office buildings developed in London. More than two and a half million square feet of stone from a large number of countries was used in the project. Of course, all of the most recent buildings were built much quicker than the pyramids and the great churches of Europe. What is it that people love about natural stone? It's the icing on the cake. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's the thing that, that makes your house your home. And it's, it is jewelry. Uh, the feeling of uh, having something natural, you know, the variation that you find in natural stone uh, that can surprise you every day with its details. Obviously, it's the nature, that it is not manufactured to look like something else. It is something else. Stone is natural. It's like people. No two pieces uh, are alike. And each one of the nuances of them give it its own character. It is a very durable building material. It has natural beauty to it as opposed to manufactured beauty. And as a result, it's aesthetic appeal and the value that it brings to a building in terms of a, its appearance and its attraction as a natural stone is something that can't be duplicated. For much of contemporary history, the stone industry labored as hands intensive simply because of the massive size and weight of the product. But with each new technological development, including the steam and gasoline engines and the electric motor, the job of quarrying the stone and processing it became easier and easier. The same goes for transportation. One of the major developments facilitating the cutting of stone was the gang saw, invented in Vermont in the early 1880s. It permitted cutting a block of stone into multiple slabs. At one time, the Vermont Marble Company is reported to have had 63 gang saws running day and night at its Sutherland Falls mills. The swinging frame gang saw eventually gave way to circular blade saws, which became a staple for cutting stone. Because of the stone's inherent hardness, it still took two or three days to slab a granite block. From rolling stones on logs by hand, shipping them on barges, and horse-drawn carriages, the process morphed to trains, trucks, and ocean-going freighters. The latter facilitated a worldwide industry where massive blocks of stones and containers of slabs are now routinely shipped around the globe. As an example, Italy, once the world's leading supplier of stone, now does more processing than quarrying. 90% of the stone fabricated in Italy comes from somewhere else. Until the late 1990s, the stone business was primarily focused on the commercial side of the business, except in Europe and some other parts of the world where stone was used for flooring, stairs, and wall coverings. There was very little demand for it in the residential arena. In the U.S., the general consensus was that residential stone was way too expensive for the consumer marketplace. Then. Several things spurred unprecedented global demand and created an industry which now employs millions of workers. The confluence of events was like a perfect storm. I think the most significant item was when they were, uh, the stone industry was able to go from the thick dimension stone, building stone, to the thinner veneers, the two and three centimeter veneers, and now with your honeycombs, your very thin laminate veneers. And the engineers were able to figure out how to actually get that anchored onto curtain walls, onto buildings, so that you could have larger use of natural stone on the exterior skin of a building. Thicker panels became a relic, and architects began designing buildings clad with granite and its incredible palette of colors and patterns. It wasn't long before American architects and designers specializing in home design began experimenting with some of the same colored stones in residential kitchens, baths, and other residential applications. The concept turned out to be a home run, 
But first, granite countertops and other stones for the home had to be competitive with many artificial plastic-like surfaces available to the consumer. And that's where perhaps the most important element in the stone industry arrived. Technology. It came at every step of the way. If you'll pardon the pun, one of the technological solutions was a gem of an idea. Before the advent of diamond wire technology, quarriers went from compressed air drilling, using wedges and shims for breakout, to jet burning, L blasting, and using drifters and specialized explosives to get the stone out of the ground. Diamond wire technology, using motors and pulleys, has revolutionized quarrying techniques. Carlos Goad is Vice President of North Carolina Granite, which operates the world's largest open-face granite quarry in Mount Airy, North Carolina. A diamond wire has a central steel woven core. Then there are diamond beads. The diamond beads are about uh, a quarter of an inch diameter, and they're about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch long. They are inserted on that uh, steel core. You hook that to a machine that rotates the diamond wire and then either slowly pulls it or pushes it down through the stone with those diamond beads doing all the cutting. Quarry design has gone from derricks and stiff legs to a drive-in format, using massive front-end loaders to pick up the blocks. All of these developments, also employing diamond technology, quadrupled the cubic feet produced per man-hour. This affordable quarrying technology made it possible to get stone out of quarries that at one time were determined unaccessible by earlier methods. It eventually resulted in the explosive growth of the business in countries, which then began to quarry and export stone. Diamond wire technology was also introduced into the slabbing process. This drastically reduced from days to hours the time it took to cut a 45,000 pound block of granite or other stone into slabs. Goad, a 40-year industry veteran, says that with the old gang saws, they would get feed rates of three quarters of an inch per hour. This meant it could take two to three days to slab a granite block. The multi-wire diamond technology, we have a machine that can put the maximum of 20 strands of wire on the one machine, then we can get uh, 23 quarters of an inch thick slabs from that machine. The diamond technology allows us to downfeed saw at the rate of about 12 to 14 inches per hour versus the old three quarters of an inch for the gang saws. The new technology has allowed companies like North Carolina Granite to become a lot more efficient. When I first came here, we had approximately 250, 275 employees. Today, we have 130 employees. Uh, we're actually producing more in volume today with fewer employees. With this diamond wire technology, they're, they're able to do it four to five times as fast as the older technology. At the fabrication level, there's computerized, what they call it CNC technology, and this technology has added a level of automation to stone fabrication that makes it a lot more precise, a lot less labor intensive, and it really has just advanced the trade to the next level. Kerry Stapleton, general manager of Independent Limestone Company in Bloomington, Indiana, has been in the stone business for 40 years. Well, in the quarry business, the quarrying was done with wires. It was done with what we call channel machines, which were started out being steam powered and ended up being electric, of course and they were very slow, took a long time. Um, the wire saws were better, but very dangerous. And then handling was also a big change that's happened. We used to have the big tall derricks. Those don't exist anymore. We don't use derricks, we use big front end loaders. And the way we quarry stone now is with these quarry saws that look like big chainsaws with diamond segmented cable reinforced belts that go around a chain. They look like a chainsaw blade. And it has made a huge difference in quarrying, able to quarry much more with the same number of people. Robert Campo, 
Vice President of Rock of Ages Corporation in Barrie, Vermont, says today's sawing and cutting technology is light years ahead of methods used in the past. They had it tough back then. We got it easy now. Now we saw everything like butter. The new sawing technology is amazing. It's helped us to reduce our costs, to remain competitive in the market. Stapleton said the use of computer-assisted technology has also advanced the industry. And you can literally program what you want the stone to look like on your computer. Send it to the saw, and the piece of stone will be laying on the bed, and this profiler will cut that piece of stone. I mean, you're just watching it. You're not cutting it anymore. The bottom line, advanced technology has drastically reduced the price of stone. It's probably a quarter of what it was, say, back in the 60s and 70s. Lower cost certainly was a major factor for the consumer boom in the use of stone in the home, but certainly not the only one. It's a piece of the earth. I mean, it's, it's taking what God made and making it more beautiful and distributing it out, giving people the opportunity to put it in their home. There's many other products you can use, but you can't get that natural beauty and that uniqueness that you get from stone. People personalize it, and that, that's why slab countertops are so personal. They select it based on what they're seeing and then touch it, and then they bond with it. You can change your cabinets, you can change your paint color, you can change your carpet, but stone is one of those things that will stay regardless of the interior changes that you want. It's a material that is forever. You're, you're not going to tire of it. These old stones are not made in one day or by one designer. It's made by Mother Nature over millions of years, okay? And so each one is different from different part of the world and coming. And so it has a very classic look which does not change that fast. I can only tell you that um, after 30 years of doing this, uh, I don't see any diminishing of that love. I would say the kitchen countertop was the most dramatic change that this industry has undergone because back in the 80s, granite and stone marble were being used in lobbies of hotels, lobbies of architectural buildings that were going up. Architects were using them in big blocks in very ornate ways, but it hadn't invaded the home yet. Backrack said there were two primary reasons for the countertop market explosion. I think people started to travel and they started to see that in upscale homes in other countries, marble, granite, limestone, sandstone, every, every stone was an integral part of the home experience. The whole design of the kitchen and bathroom especially uh, was just very different over in Europe. So I think the taste changed and the timing was such that the technology changed. We were able to cut slabs more efficiently stone was coming in from all over the world so there were more and more colors available and the price came down by sources manufacturing stone directly. Price came down, the availability was greater and I think it became the next new residential wave. The kitchen is really the focal point of the home now. Families gather in the morning for breakfast, they meet out, meet up at the end of the day for dinner. It's, uh, it brings the family together, and stone, it's the centerpiece of the kitchen. It's what you see on your countertop. It adds to the room. It adds excitement. As the countertop boom spread across the country, fabricators and installers that for years had specialized in commercial stonework with an occasional high-end residential project, they were ready to diversify, and they did. Many companies that previously specialized in sales and installation of kitchen countertops, bathroom vanities, other installations, and ceramic and other forms of tile also saw this as a great way to expand their business. Many entrepreneurs also gravitated to the business. As a result, at one time, not long ago, it is estimated that there were at least 10,000 stone companies in the United States. Stone was a boon to the kitchen and bath design industry, which capitalized on its popularity to offer customers a replacement for originally installed laminate and solid surfaces, like Formica and Corian. The big box do-it-yourself stores also began selling natural stone countertops in their stores, farming out installation to local fabricators and installers. In the beginning, many of the old limestone companies 
bought and inventoried a significant amount of slabs. That provided designers, contractors, and consumers with a one-stop but limited shopping experience where they could select the stone and contract to have it fabricated. From the mid to late 1990s, the kitchen countertop market first rocketed to an estimated $15 billion in sales, then surged further. Ultimately, the industry grew from 40,000 to 120,000 employees. That growth provided huge opportunities for those well-prepared established companies and entrepreneurs that were on the ground floor of the residential stone revolution in the U.S. One of those entrepreneurs was Manu Shah, an Indian immigrant and mechanical engineer who was living and working in Fort Wayne, Indiana in 1975. Uh, my wife uh, had just delivered baby and she says I got to do something besides being a mom at home. So that's where we started uh, looking at importing and exporting. And our first project was bringing a natural stone from India in uh, tombstone or memorials. And we did that for seven more years. In 1982, the Shaws got a major break. They were selected to provide the black granite for the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. When the last panel was delivered, three days after that, I quit my job and gone into the full-time in stone business. They eventually moved the business to Orange, California. After doing some research, Shaw found there was a residential market for natural stone. He spent two years convincing architects across the country to use black granite for kitchen countertops. He eventually succeeded. I did some analysis at that time and I was shocked to see America was a wood country. All home had a wood everywhere. Shaw found that only 2% of the value of the average U.S. home, minus the land, was spent on natural stone. In Europe, it was 8%. Shaw knew there was a market, potentially a big one. By 87, we had our first small warehouse, 5,400 square foot. Now we have 2.5 million square foot around the country. The company, MS International, which literally started as a mom-and-pop operation, now has 13 super showrooms and warehouses across the country. MSI is a wholesaler, selling stone slabs and other stone products from around the world to fabricators, designers, contractors, and retailers. Today, MSI is one of the country's largest distributors of stone. It imports stone from nearly 40 countries and supports more than 1,500 fabricators, but it has plenty of competition. 60-year-old Walker Zanger, headquartered in New York City and a pioneer in selling stone for commercial applications, has a nationwide presence. Arizona Tile, headquartered in Tempe, Arizona, is a major player in the West, with showrooms and warehouses in multiple locations. Dal Tile is also a major supplier of stone. It's part of the Mohawk Industries family, which has expanded its burgeoning ceramic tile manufacturing and retail business. Among its customers, it serves major retailers and also has a full commercial division. Roy Vienna, project manager for stone slabs at Dal Tile, offers this explanation of why consumers are enamored with natural stone. They like to personalize the products they select, whether it's a limestone from Portugal or a marble from Italy or a granite from Brazil. They just, they love not only that personalization, they love a little of the history and the story. So I think that really separates the stone business from, from many others and makes it makes it unique for the homeowners. Our company was one of the first ones. People started to bring in granite and sell it for, for uh, countertops. And we brought in a thicker granite slab, actually, um, because the typical granite countertop was inch and a half thick in those days. So we, uh, I remember we used to bring an inch and a half granite, and then we thin it down to inch and a quarter granite. And it just took off um, almost by itself. People uh, saw it, they liked it. All of a sudden, there was this huge a uh, variety of materials that nobody had considered using for countertops before. Rube Shaw, executive vice president of MS International, says that even though there are a handful of major players in the stone distribution business, 
the stone industry in general is very fragmented. Even with the scope in MSI, the firm only has a 10 to 12% market share in the United States. In the past, he said only very high-end kitchen and bath dealers would carry natural stone. Today it's everywhere. It became affordable to the masses, and as a result, the, the marketing of it has changed dramatically. You'll find it in almost any retail show, any flooring retail showroom, uh, any kitchen and bath design center will, uh, without a doubt, have granite. Um, and of course, the high end is still there. Luckily, there's a whole new set of very exotic uh, colors, which attract the, uh, the high end buyer, um, while at the same time, um, there's, a, there's an affordable option for the masses. As an original promoter of natural stone for residential use, Manu Shaw has his own love affair for the products his company sells. He says every block of stone has many beautiful surfaces inside that literally rival a work of art. It's up to fabricators and installers to maximize that beauty wherever natural stone is used. National, regional, and localized stone distributors have provided consumers, architects, kitchen and bath designers, and contractors tremendous options in terms of selection and inventory. Well, I think having distributors has helped uh, expand the, the palette of stones that are available um, and expand the, the availability of, of materials from all over the world. Um, a, a local fabricator doesn't have the wherewithal to stock all of those materials. Manu Shaw says that since 1987, the amount of stone as a percentage of the value of homes in the U.S., not counting the land, has risen from 2 to 8 percent. The percent in Europe has climbed from 8 to 10 percent. While not as pervasive as in America, the use of natural stone countertops is also catching on in a number of other non-European countries. While there's certainly competition from other laminated and man-made stone materials, natural stone is now the preferred kitchen and bathroom countertop and vanity material for both new homes and in the remodeling business. Not only is it beautiful, but natural stone installations are proven to enhance the value of homes on resale. The huge countertop market, which developed in the United States, has had a profound effect on the growth of stone quarrying around the world. Again, it was technology that led the way. Jeffrey Matthews of Atlanta is a 40-year stone industry veteran and now serves as an industry consultant. The boom came when the technology was given to other countries, mainly by the Italians um, and the Germans, to sell the machines because they couldn't sell enough in Italy. So they started selling in all other countries. So uh, Spain, France, Portugal, uh, uh, all these countries started and were able now to try to market their stone directly. Prior to that, a great deal of the quarried stone was shipped in blocks to Italy for fabricating, then forwarded to the end user for installation. Matthew says there's still tremendous potential growth for the stone industry. We still have all the African nation, Middle East, Far East, South America. There's so much potential growth in the, what can be in the stone and how many countries will produce more stones or find new quarries. Luca Berlamaca, president of Decaloras Mamoras e Granitos in Brazil, is an example of how exported technology helped spur the stone business in Brazil. An Italian geologist, he was sent to Brazil by an Italian trading company to manage their operations, which primarily consisted of quarrying blocks and shipping them to Italy and Spain for fabrication. Due to the easier access to technology, basically, uh, know-how, uh, uh, you start having more and more factories processing the material in Brazil. You know, the cost of freight, of course, is very expensive. Uh, cost of labor in Brazil by that was uh, cheap and so was much more convenient to cut and process the material, cut and polish with labs in Brazil than in Italy. We had uh, several companies investing in technology, importing technology mainly from Italy and developing a new uh, kind of business, you know, just uh, uh, and exporting slabs trades to their final destination. 
The same thing happened in India, China, and other countries, where slabs and cut-to-order pieces of stone for commercial projects began to flourish. The fact is, the stone industry has become an incredible job creation machine around the world and is one of the few industries today supporting rural regions of the world. A primary reason is that technology enabled countries virtually anywhere to quarry, process, and ship finished stone products. Today, Brazil and China are the largest sources of imported natural stone into the United States, followed by Turkey, Italy, and India. When you consider all the people that are part of the stone industry or supported around the world, millions are involved in tens of thousands of companies, ranging from small quarries to huge fabricators. Bottom line, natural stone is a very large presence around the globe. In the residential arena, natural stone involves much more than just kitchens, baths, and floors. Stone is being used everywhere. Interior stairs, fireplaces, entryways, living room decor, furniture, creative wall treatments, outside for landscaping, pool copings, stepping stones, and more. The tremendous growth of the stone business has also produced worldwide markets for companies that specialize in the development and sale of products for stone installation, preparation, and care and maintenance. Two of the major companies are Custom Building Products of Seal Beach, California, and Mapay, which operates in 28 countries. That growth has also lured a number of stone copycat firms into the business. While the U.S. imports more than a billion dollars of stone a year, far more than it exports, the growth of the business has also been good to American companies that quarry and fabricate stone, both for domestic consumption. The largest U.S. natural stone firm, Cold Spring Granite of Minnesota, which has a number of quarries in the U.S., Cold Spring has been in business for more than 110 years. Others whose history span more than a century include North Carolina Granite Corporation and Vermont Marble Corporation. In 1900, there were at least 60 granite companies in Vermont. Today, there is only one, Rock of Ages Corporation, which quarries, fabricates, and is a leading supplier of monuments. The first limestone was quarried in Indiana in 1827. Today, there are nine limestone quarries operating in the vicinity of Bloomington. The Indiana Limestone Association boasts that its product was used to build 35 of the existing U.S. State Capitol buildings. The widening source of natural stone due to new technology has certainly been a main driver for the use of more stone in commercial and residential applications. Another major component has been automation in measuring and fabricating the job. Some fabricators still build thin wooden templates as the basis for residential work. The newest technology involves digital templating. Multiple laser readings are taken of the area to be stone clad. The information is then fed into a computer which drives automated saws to make precise cuts. Automated systems also polish and edge the stone eliminating hours of hand labor. The result, more perfect fabricating and reduced cost. Another element that has helped to streamline bidding and stone selection has been the internet. This is especially effective in the commercial end of the business. The internet, no more shipping multiple sets of blueprints to contractors. It all goes electronically. Architects and designers can now view stone samples and actual production cuts electronically. Architects can call you and say, hey, I got this detail. I want you to take a look at it. I just sent you an email. Uh, can you look at it and, and tell me what you think? We had a blueprint machine and all the tracings that I did had to be copied. And then we would send multiple uh, copies of those off to the uh, architects and engineers through the mail. Now with the CAD systems and internet, all of those can be sent electronically. We don't have to make for the mail to go both routes and the, uh, what we send today, the architect gets today. Today, especially when it comes to major commercial projects, 
Architects and designers often want more than small stone samples, slabs in distributor showrooms, or photographs before making a decision on the type and color of stone to use. They go to major trade shows like Marmamac or to the source, the quarry or block distributors to get a close up look at what the stones look like. The most important thing about going to the quarry is understanding a sense of scale. When you're standing on the mountain or you're standing in the, in the lake basins of, of Indiana limestone, and you realize that as you cut a piece out of the mountain or you cut a piece out of the, the lake beds, that that piece has to be lifted up by a piece of machine or onto a truck. The truck has to move it to a fabrication yard. And the logistics and the scale of those operations Knowing that really shapes the way you think about how it gets used in buildings. Natan Bibliowitz echoes Donaldson's sentiments. We have a vision about the project and uh, stone is so unpredictable in some ways that we need to really go and see what is available at any particular time. Be able to see all the blocks and see how whatever is available actually works best for the project in, in question. Today, with the emphasis on building things green, one of the factors architects, designers, and contractors like most about natural stone is its ultimate sustainability. It's inherently sustainable. It's, uh, it's been there forever. It's a natural material. I think that's key uh, in any building. If you have the ability to use stone, it's a tremendous plus. There is nothing more sustainable than natural stone in our industry. Natural stone is also a environmental uh, friendly material. I mean, uh, it has been uh, used uh, for uh, thousands of years. Today, because of new technology and techniques in environmental rehabilitation, which have reduced energy and water use, as well as waste, natural stone is considered more sustainable than ever. Architects, designers, contractors, rehabilitation specialists, and consumers not only love natural stone for its beauty, versatility, and durability, they are also impressed with the new technology and the vast reservoir of talented craftsmen who have raised the bar in quality at every level. In the United States, a great deal of credit for improved quality is due to the efforts of the Marble Institute of America, or MIA, a 70-year-old global trade association. MIA's widely distributed Dimension Stone Design Manual sets the standard for quality fabrication and installation throughout much of the world. Over the past decade, MIA has also trained thousands of individual company personnel in best practices for production and safety. It's a primary source for stone industry education and promotion. Wherever I travel in the world over the last 30 years, I sit down in an office in China, I sit down in a quarry in India, and I see the design manual from the Marble Institute of America there on the wall, because that is the Bible. That's the standard to which people want to conform, and that is what architects, designers, engineers go to when they have a question with regarding natural stone, if there are any issues. With a continuing love affair that goes back a long way, a seemingly endless supply of stone, with new quarries constantly coming online in developing countries around the world, with ever-evolving computer and manufacturing technology, and with an improving commercial and residential construction and remodeling environment, there's a bright future for natural stone. I think the future of the stone business will be one of growth because I think the emphasis on the home is here to stay. When it's used in the proper application, you know, it's, it's going to be there forever. So it's luxury, it's beautiful, it's natural. I love it because it's just so beautiful. There's no, there really is no two pieces alike. And uh, the fun part about cutting a piece of natural stone or seeing it cut is that no eyes have ever seen what's inside that piece of stone. Stone has as much style as the clothes we wear, as the homes we build, uh, as the architects can dream up in their uh, beautiful designs. There is no replacement for natural stone. And that's been true throughout history. 
Man and natural stone have been a constant throughout the evolution of society, with new and more beautiful colors of stone continuously evolving and new generations of consumers appreciating the impact of nature and trying to protect the environment. Stone is assured a great future. Tony Malassani is right. There's no replacement for natural stone. There never has been. There never will be. The History of Man and Stone, a documentary, was produced by the Marble Institute of America through a very generous sponsorship grant from MS International, one of America's leading natural stone distributors, and with additional generous support from Daltile, with both natural stone retail locations and distribution centers across the country, Marmomac of Verona, Italy, the world's largest and most important natural stone trade shows and Stone Expo Marmomac Americas, the leading natural stone exposition in North America held annually in Las Vegas.